Um, what I'm going to do is sh you've all been sent a link to the to two murals or whiteboards today, um, but I'm going to go through one of them first. So I'll just share my screen. Ta -da! And we're going to start off as always with an icebreaker, because if I get you to talk at the start, you're more likely to talk at various points on the way through. Um, so I've got a big list down the side and I'm just going to go work, work my way down it. We're going to do your name, your pronoun, where you're from, and do you miss paper tickets? Because I keep trying to think of new ones for these. So if anyone has ideas for good bus questions. Um, so I'm Dr. J, I use they as a pronoun. Uh, I'm from ThoughtWorks and I'm working as a service designer for Department for Transport. Do I miss paper tickets? No, because I never got to grips with them. I'm really enjoying contactless and I'm enjoying not even having to have an Oyster card. I can just now do it with my phone and I don't need to remember anything else. Fantastic, thank you so much. So everyone should have uh, a, should have been sent a link which will be in one of the emails that you got from Eventbrite. And there's two links. One is to one is to uh, something uh, they're, they're both to, to murals. One had the password and I'm just now having to go and find what passwords I put on them because I can't recall, but it enabled me to tell them apart. Um, one had the password scope, but that's not the one we want to go to. We want to go to the one that's got the password Naptan, uh, Naptan consumers. If I, and hopefully you'll, you'll all see, you'll all start to come along. And I discovered I could do things that, uh, that could be a transport based, so we've got speed boats and cars and tuk tuks rather than animals today um, as icons when you come along. Hi, Dr. Um, Jay, it's, it's Joe. Um, I don't think I've got those links. I think due to a, a slight cock up at my end, I failed to register until about five minutes before the meeting. So, uh, no problems. What I'll do is if you give me a second, I'm just going to move to the I'm right sure. spot on the mural and I will just throw the link up. On the mural for you and that lovely pleasant sounds like you're on an airplane bing bong says time's up hopefully everyone's had a chance to put their stuff in there's a couple of blank oh pardon me what are appearing blank to me um post-its if you're typing on those if you just press enter it'll populate them Okay, so I'm going to start reading through. Um, I know I popped on a couple to have a look as to who who wrote them, but um, if you're, um, I'm not going to call people out, but I'd like us to discuss any of them. If you think of something, just raise your hand or start talking. That's totally fine. So we'll start off with critical to good journey plans. That's brilliant. Accuracy, status, all stops in use must be mentioned, reliable source to match and align trans exchange data. All stops in use must be mentioned. So does this mean that um, the person who wrote this, I just want to double check and make sure that I understand that when you're talking about all stops in use, you mean every time, every place a bus can stop is within the data. Mike, you've unmuted, so I'm assuming you're about to tell me something. Sorry, no, no, I, I was a mistake <laughs> on my behalf. Sorry, so I, I'm, I, 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 I was a bit slow to get the hang of this um, your uh, mural thing, so um, I, I'll, I'll stay out of this. Yeah, that wasn't me. No, sorry. OK, but if you've got thoughts, if any of these prompt, prompt, prompt thoughts or prompt ideas, please let me know because it's it's really useful. Um, accurate in in all its dimensions, i.e. spatial and non-spatial. That's really good. Uh, accurate and easy to access. Aligned with other data sources like TNDS. TNDS. I don't recall what TNDS is. Can somebody help me understand that one? Sure, that's um, the travel line timetable set that uses trans exchange. 
uh, travel. So that's the travel line timetable set. Travel line yeah. national data set. Ah, fantastic. Appreciate that. Brilliant. Um, authoritative and accurate data. So we've got a thing about accuracy, and I'm going to ask a couple of questions about accuracy, I think, when we get down to business rules. Data that is fit I can kind of jump on the authoritative side of things. That's my point. I think when anything you've got and it's marked with quality, you need to know is there any kind of, um, you know, is it how accurate is it? Is it you know government stamped? Is it kind of recognised? I think when you talk about data quality, you have you know, you know you have low quality, high quality, and you have the authoritative data, which is you know the gold standard. I think that's really important, especially with things like NAPTAN, and that encompasses everything that's part of it. So, for example, is the name the correct name? Is the location accurate to you know one meter? Is everything correct on it? Is that the authoritative? Is that the definitive view of data, basically, of that data set? Brilliant. That's such a good uh, explanation. Definitive. I can't spell today. We'll just deal with that, and it can sort it out. So I like the idea that it's government stamped. It's kind of that gold standard stamped, stamped with all the bars and everything on it. Um, data is fit for the purpose that it was that it is designed for, different to the purpose that it is being used for. Um, I appreciate this view. I think it's quite a good one. Um, uh, is there a lot of data in NAPTAN that we that we think we might not be using for for the right purpose? So uh, we're using it for a purpose other than what it was designed for. Yes. Should yeah. we take that one offline, Tim, and have a deep discussion, a deep dive discussion <laughs> with you on that one? Yeah, it probably is worth it. I'll add that as an action point. Just, just bear with me here a moment. I've got a whole little section here. Tim, uh, data purpose. Right, jump back to here. Uh, a set of rules that uh, are mysterious and not consistently known. So this is about the business rules that are applied to make the data quality. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yes, I agree that they are mysterious. I have found 131 of them. We're going to talk about some of them today. They are still mysterious to me. And if anyone has business rules that you're using to clean up the data. So if you get data from that TAN and you say, actually, I need to do this to the data to make it usable, please let us know because that's going to help us understand where the business rules and where our data quality is falling short. Because if you're having to manipulate and make changes in the data to make it work for you, that means that we're not doing the right thing at our end of making sure that the data is there and is of good quality. And if we can put some of those in, I know some of them are going to be your secret source and we can have discussions about that. But if we can put some of those in, that's really going to help us create a really good data source for everyone to use. Because at the moment, there's lots of conversations about the data quality, but it again, the, the rules are mysteries. Um, all the, although mysteries and duplicates and some that don't seem to and some that seem to contradict as well. So it's trying to figure out what was there, why it's there, and what purpose it's trying to achieve. Um, ensures consistency of data across providers. So does this mean, is this consistency from the people who are producing the data? So all the local transport authorities and that need to have consistency in how they're using fields and, and how they're bringing us data. Yeah, that was the idea. That's great. Just making sure I've got I've got these um, totally across everyone's minds. Data precision, i.e., co coordinate resolution, is fit for purpose. So this kind of lines up with this accuracy to one meter. So when we say purpose and accuracy and coordinates, is this about the location of a bus stop? It is accurate within a meter radius or is it a meter diameter? Is it within a meter squared? All of these are slightly different 
measurements of a meter um, and volume because is it is it understanding is it within a bay or on the footpath is it a extended out into the road bus stop or an in a bay that the bus slips into is that important stuff that people need to know David um, it's a meter is just what we really need but 10 meters is what the GPS does um, and then you're trying to resolve where the bus is with where the bus stop is so we're on a, a loser to start with but if we could get to one meter on GPS then that would help I mean some of the bus stops were defined in the first place with um, little hand Garmin's that only had two satellites and things like that so it's not surprising they're not that accurate so just help me unpick that just ever so slightly so your bus knows where it is by about 10 meters and the bus stop needs to be by a meter so that you and you're correlating where the bus thinks it is to where the bus stop actually is when it stops there is have i got that right we're, we're trying to use the bus stop location to determine that the bus has reached the stop so it knows the correct fare to charge the passenger and right. that's also now tap in and tap out so you need it at both stops so we normally use a 30 meter radius on the bus position to encompass the bus stop right Cool. Um, Neil, did you have a thought on this as well? <clears throat> yeah, where I was coming from was was more within the database itself. Uh, the, so the, the you've got enough decimal places for a lot long, um, and uh, you don't need any decimal places really for for British national grid sort of thing. So just the, within the, the database table, um, you're using a suitable. Uh, uh, resolution in, in your number field to, to represent the coordinate. And it's as much as not overestimating the accuracy of a stop by giving a precise, you know, the, the sort of 15, 15 decimal point precision of a number doesn't actually mean it's accurate to that mm -hmm. level sort of thing. So, and then that comes down to the metadata as well. So, so, um, just making sure the let long and the easting northing. The easting northing is the other way of the two different ways of telling where a bus stop is. Um, yes. Yeah, so, so people in Britain um, are sort of born and brought up with going along the corridor and then up the stairs, which is the British national grid. So, so you, you, it's measured in meters from from uh, from from a point in the sea. So it's, it's um, I'm going to put my foot in it here by saying it's similar to the New Zealand national grid, assuming you're in Zealand, because I've not heard you say fish and chips yet. Um, fish and chips. You're maybe Australian. No, I'm a New Zealander. It's okay. Because it's usually fish and chips. Um, so similar to the New Zealand grid, uh, so it's meters and it's projected. Um, the rest of the world and everybody now is using lat long, which is um, uh, an unprojected map system, and um, and so it's quite different. So, but but it uses points. So instead of whole numbers, um, you don't start from zero. It, uh, it's it's a sort of so it's, you need uh, much more sort of uh, numbers after the decimal point to to capture uh, your coordinates. But again. Uh... There's there's lots and lots of flavours of lat long, so that then comes back to the, the metadata. And everybody assumes that it's WGS84, which is what Google Maps uses, but there's, there's hundreds of flavours. And I also have a question. So the projection versus the non-projection, doesn't the projection versus non-projection doesn't matter so much down the bottom of the country, but matters more as you get more up towards the top uh, north north of the country because it gets closer to the um, pole and the lat long goes a bit weird and the projections go a bit weird. Things appear bigger than they should be because of the way that we build maps. 
Mm, and, well, that that's sort of that's sort of built into the the coordinate system that you use. So, so WGS lat long is yes, it's yeah. It, it, if if you've got your 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 numbers, um, then yeah. If you keep your 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 sort of system consistent, then it's it's not too bad. You don't get much of a difference. The way it looks on a map, for sure, you you get the sort of stretched out stuff going north, but it doesn't mean that the data is any less accurate. Right. That was that was all that I was just needing to double check. Um, Dan. Yeah, so I'll just add to that. So with like lat longs, I think you need to get to the accuracy of an easting northing. I think you need five decimal places um, after the dot to get it to a one meter accuracy. Um, so and so sometimes we've seen with data sets, people will put less than that, and then effectively they'll try and add zeros on the end to get it to five. But yeah. I, that effectively isn't making it any better because it's based off the first the first few coordinates um so yeah but our preference generally is is easting northing uh, using the british national grid it's also quite popular the grid system all over the world so we use the irish national grid quite a bit as well for looking at the naptan data in ireland um, and places like that um can i ask a question of this audience just super quick if i went through and had a look at the lat long and the easting northings would i find would I find some bus stops that didn't match where those two things might not match? Or is it just about some, sometimes the lat long is a bit more rounded and a bit more vague than the easting northings, which is like, it's the spot here because of this, it's within this grid. So the, the problem we see in the data sometimes is they might match up, but they might not match up with a underlying uh, map. So Google right. Maps or an open street map or an ordnance survey map or something like that. Because sometimes when people have entered these into the systems, not via a, a GPS, but actually doing it on the maps, they've their stoppers here. If the map's misaligned at source, then that can effectively make it sit in the wrong position. Um, so that's that's definitely a problem we see in the data. So it might map, so it might line up perfectly with one mapping supplier, but not with another mapping supplier. And this is where the authoritative kind of thing comes into into play that I mentioned a minute ago to make sure that it is in the right position. But to do that, you need to have the right base map, not to use our company name, but the right base map <laughs> and use it effectively to make sure it sits in the in the in the correct position. That is something that we've recognized and it ties into we've discovered a lot of the business rules are all interlinked around the map and what road it reads and things like that. And that can make quite a big difference, especially with the bearings and, and that. So that is a whole separate piece that I'm going to be having some explorations and some discussions on. Um, and there, there are a whole lot of issues when you when you um, reproject from one coordinate system to another. So I, I actually don't know um, if you know what you know what the business rule is is when you're creating a new bus stop on that time. Is is British National Grid then cord uh, like um, changed into that long, or do you start with that long that's converted into to Eastings Northings? I I don't know how that works. And um, also, it would it would also depend on you know as somebody said, if somebody's capturing the the bus stop location on a handheld GPS or on a smartphone, they are not accurate at all. And uh, you know everybody thinks they are. The perception is that they are, but they're not. Um, you need to sort of total station thing. It's a big tripod um, to get any sort of level of submeter accuracy, um, and and again, you know, if, if you're doing it on, on a map base, then 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 you know, you're absolutely right. It depends on on whether your map base is accurate. If you're putting a point on the map, if it's a photocopy, then then there's all sorts of issues. Mm -hmm. And I think that's some of the things um, that's brilliant because that's giving us more things to think about one of the next things that we need to think about is the mapping system and which mapping system is used because we we know that when ito world changed from one to another that created a whole pile of misaligned bus stops and misaligned records so we're just trying to understand what what is one that everyone is going to go yep if we choose this here's the here's the pros here's the cons and we've done this we've made this decision consciously not just fallen into a decision neil um uh, yeah it depends 
as well as to how much of these data are historic. I mean, what you were saying before about the, the um, information degrading the further north that you go, to an extent, that's kind of right, because the Ordnance Survey went through a, a, a process called uh, positional accuracy in uh, sort of around about year 2000, um, because the original Ordnance Survey um, paper maps, the error propagated more as you went further north, uh, and, uh, and it was, there was rivers in the north of Scotland that were, were shown flowing the wrong way on the map just because the surveyors went to the pub and guessed instead of actually surveying what the ground did. Um, and so there was there was a whole pile of error that was kind of basically dumped around Loch Lomond. So if you if you were geo-referencing stuff against the Ordnance Survey 50,000 sheets in Scotland, chances are when it went digital and, and we're now on master map and all that sort of stuff, the original data will be out of place. It's very similar to, to New Zealand. You've, you've got positional actions, but just because countries moving so much, um, with, with so it's, it's uh, that sort of positional accuracy information is, you know, ordnance survey is not perfect. Absolutely, um, that that's really good to know because it's also ONS versus OpenStreetMap versus whatever Google provides, all of those things, whichever one is chosen is going to have its pros and cons and also have its complications that we need to be aware of and everyone will need to adapt to that complication. And it's doing that knowingly and consciously and not just falling over something going, oh, we'll use this one. And they'll, oh no, we'll use this one now. That's not where we want to be, in my opinion. Um, got two more. Data quality is the degree of accuracy of data. Example, bus stop names, code, grid references, etc. A good degree of accuracy would enable making better decisions. When you say better decisions, is this for the consumer? Is this for routing buses? Routing buses? I don't know which way you say it in this country. Sindhu. Yeah, yeah. So from my point of view, I would think um, it helps making better decisions for us. For example, if we wanted to add a new stop, you know, create an ATCO code, we look at the existing data. Now we try to look for us for the sequence of stops that are in that area. So uh, if there are already a few stops in that area, then we try to create a sequence from what already exists. Uh, and I think it helps you make a good decision like that only if you've got accurate data. And moreover, I, in County Durham, what we do is um, we add a letter at the end of the ATCO code to indicate the direction. So if you add A at the end of the ATCO code, it means that the bus travels north. So it's important you put the right letter so you know which direction the bus actually goes in. Yeah, so yeah. I think I think it's important to have a good degree of accuracy or you might just put the wrong direction. The bus probably actually goes north, but then you put the letter for south and that's not going to help anyone. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, I think it's also important for the operators so they know which stop uses which service. Yeah. That makes that makes a ton of sense. So thank you for that. Um, and the very last one, metadata is provided, i.e. what coordinate reference system is used. Which I know, I know that we've we're probably going to talk a lot more about coordinate systems, Neil. Yeah, yeah. Again, that that's just so putting it in black and white that you know the the lat longs are a specific data when you're WGS eighty four and um and, and so it's, it's it's all up front. That makes a ton of sense. And I think that's one for me to go and double check and 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 read up, although I'm sure Tim will be able to reference the page that I should go look at for that. Um I just want to move on to another question because what we're trying to understand, um, and you'll see some of this a little bit more when I get on to talking about the scope. Um, I want to understand the DFT systems that everyone is using because we need to understand the other DFT systems we should be talking to because you're taking our data and, for example, you're taking NAPTAN and data from BODS and combining them into doing something else. So we and BODS need to be working closely together to make sure that the flow of data is great to them and things like that. So we're using this to try and find if there's any other systems that you're using within DFT. So there's a couple of 
diagrams here. If there's a DFT system that we haven't mentioned, please create a sticky and put it on. Um, I'd like to give you just a couple of minutes to kind of put um, on the system which ones are used by you personally. So which systems you personally take the data from, which systems are done by members of your team, and which which are used by other departments or contractors or somebody outside of your team. And this is going to give us the view of just being able to understand where these different systems sit and what they're called. Um, one of the things that people have done is they used a little circle and just did a coloured circle um, or something like that. I can track, I'll tell you, I can track who puts what up. So if I need to really dive into detail, I can find out which which dots were used by who or, or anything like that. So I'd like to give you a couple of minutes to go through and do that. And if there's anything you put up, I will come and ask about questions like NCSD. I will ask, ask about. I'm going to give you three minutes for that. Hopefully it's quite nice and fast just to put some dots on and say these are the systems that I use. So just having a look at what systems you, you will use, um, Nubtig and uh, Naptan, what a surprise. Um, I'm taking it, there's a couple of dots here that are on Nubtig that might just be, I was putting dots out because we've got more dots on Nubtig than we have on Naptan, which kind of confuses me because Nubtig, I think, is even less loved um, and liked than Naptan. Uh, we've got quite a lot of people using BODs, a few people using FAIRS or will be using FAIRS, a lot of people using real-time bus info and a couple of people using incident reporting and one person using Street Manager. Um, just going to find out, the person using Street Manager, if you would be so kind as to let me know, um, are you using Street Manager to look for roadworks or to do roadworks? I think I might have put that on by accident. I'm sorry. I'm I'm not. <laughs> um, ignore That's my. That's okay, Mike. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll take that. it off. There yeah. we go. It's disappeared. I I was just asking because it's an unusual combination to have somebody using Naptan and Street Manager, um, and in, in the same way. Um, by other members of your team, we've got Nubtig, Naptan, Bods, Fares, and Real Time Bus Information, which we kind of expect. And then this new lovely one, NCSD. Could somebody help me understand what NCSD is? Yeah, I can say that. So that's the National Coach Services Database. Ah. So that lists all the coach services from Megabus or National Express or Airport or Airlink or people like that. And it provides all the timetable information for that. Just like the TNDS, but for coaches. For national coaches. Yes. Oh, it's like yes. bods. Oh, I guess it's like the bods for, for coaches. But it's only, it's, only, it's only the coach data set that's in there. Cool. I was about to ask, is it bods for coaches? But it's, uh, I'm pleased you, you volunteered that rather so, so, than me making that assumption. So it kind of is on the timetable side of things. So it, it produces an ACLOSIF file or a trans exchange file um, of, of data. So that needs to link into an app to see where the coach depots and the coach stops are located. But this is really like the national coach services. This is all the coaches, the mega bus that's the only one that's running in there at the moment is the one that's a mega bus that's running from London to Scotland, for example. But yeah, generally it would have uh, lots of other coach services uh, within it. And it's all the timetables. So, yeah. Yeah. And so that's using Naptan to find, because there are some bus stops that are coach stops, but there are also coach stops that are only coach stops. Um, so it's pulling all of that information out of Naptan. Exactly right. Fantastic. That's really good to know. And we hadn't even considered it. So we will need to go find its owner and have a chat with them and just make sure that, it's, that, that it's we're someone, all linked up. Someone called Mira at the DFT owns it. Ah. I know Mira. She's she's also looking after bods, so that's going to make life easy for us. Um, real time bus information that's using Siri VM, um, as far as I'm aware, and then by other departments, contractors, 
we've got Nubtig, Naptan, Bod, Spheres, real time bus information. Nobody really using incident reporting. Um, this blue dot on Street Manager. Yeah, that's me. I've got some, I've got subbies that use Street Manager. And is that because they're doing contracting work or they're needing to look at the contracting work that is being done? They're, they're looking at the work that's being done and so the it, impact it will have on bus timetables and that sort of thing. So it's a read. It's it's read rather than write. Yeah. Cool. Um, that's really good to know. We've made some contact with the street manager. One quick uh, one up here is just double checking. Uh, yeah, that's me incident, again. I'm, I'm just trouble when it comes to all these things. <laughs> you are always trouble, Tim. Um, so, incident reporting, I was just double checking. That's the one of like, there's been a road traffic accident or something, and this road is blocked for a couple of hours. So all the buses are having to divert in crazy ways. Uh, yeah, specifically, it's the um, uh, Transport for the North um, Disruptions Database. Just making sure that I, I I got that. So I take it TFL and Transport for Greater Manchester and pretty much everybody has some kind of disruption system that they use. Uh, yeah, and they're all different. Of course they are. For now. <laughs> for now. <laughs> um, fantastic. Is there anything, does anyone feel that we've missed anything on this section? Does everyone feel that we've kind of captured all of the different spaces and places and, and services that we've got there. Fantastic. So we're going to move on to talking a bit more about business rules um, because I I have here and those who've done this a couple of times have been to more than one of these will recognize these rules. I have here the top 10 is actually the top 13, but who's counting the top 13 rules that we love. Th there were two sections around ACTO code and locality that we rated the highest um, when we discussed the groupings of business rules. So I pulled all of those business rules out. Now, what I'd like you to do is to take a couple of minutes. Um, this will be a bit of a group effort. If somebody puts it somewhere and you you disagree put it where you think it should be and then we'll i'll see things moving around and we'll have a bit of a discussion about it um i'd like you to put the ones that the rule that you think is most important off to the left and the rule that you think is not important off to the right there are some duplicates in there i'm totally aware of that um and there are some that don't appear like the duplicates but actually are as well so um have a couple of minutes and just move these around because we want to know what you think are the most important business rules. So what I'm going to do is just take a few minutes and read through what we think is important and make any notes or anything like that. It doesn't surprise me that you've uh, given where most what most of you work on and what what you do that you're focused a lot more on the coordinates on the coordinates side. So let me just zoom in. So we've got stop point in water, stop point geocode is more than 50 meters away from land. So this is important because we don't want stops in the middle of the of the North Sea. Unless it's a ferry stop. Unless it's a ferry stop. So that's a really good point. Let me just grab one of these. Unless a ferry stop. Stop. Um, do you have many stops that trigger up something like this currently? Anyone? Again, this is maybe a tricky one because sometimes if somebody's looking at it on a GIS system and they're using a boundary file for land that is quite generalised, then it's it's the land layer that's the issue and not the stops. But the stop is going to look as though it's in the water. So land layer on boundaries. Uh, and I'm assuming, given that Scotland's a bit more like New Zealand and that you've got very wiggly land boundaries and sea boundaries compared to other parts of the country um, with fjords and, and rivers and things like that, that the land layer is a lot more complicated than 
in other parts of the country? Well, not necessarily. I would suppose like somewhere like Cornwall is very incised as well in the coastline. Um, but the, the, the chances of a road being right next to that sort of topography are pretty minimal as well. I, I suppose it's just it, sometimes this issue is is not the fault of Naptan, but it is the context in which Naptan is being looked at. So if the context is not as precise as it should be, then then it's going to throw up what looks like a Naptan problem. Mm -hmm. Context of how it's being looked at. That's really good to know. So I guess the question here would be, what is the definition of where land is? What is the answer for what? What is where is land? Where is not the land? So uh, oh, so so here's a that's that's really good. Is land is water where land isn't? <laughs> <laughs> Depends on the time of day. Oh. Good grief, don't do that to me, that's bad, because you have ginormous tides here. Yeah, uh, <laughs> that does come into it in some stops where there's um, um, causeways that get taken over by the tide and uh, buses stop at them depending on tide conditions. They're, they've all had to be placed much further inland and they're in false locations because of the whole, it was in water problem. Right, placed in land, placed in accurately to avoid trigger. Yeah, how you cope with it in trans exchange, I've still got no idea to this day where you've got a bus that, that travels on one road when it's low tide and another road when it's high tide. Um. <laughs> yes. I must, go, I must go and have a look because um, the... The airport on Tyree, the planes land on the beach, which of course is water at high tide. So I must go and have a look and, and see if there's stops for, for airports. Wow. Yes, that would be because that should show up as an airport because it's obviously a public transport service. But unless it's a private landing strip, no. that is no, it's public. OK, right. Unexpected things that I hadn't yet thought of to add complications. Um, made those notes. Uh, is there anything else around water? There's, there's two of them, and I'll just put them on top of each other because I know that this, I know that the rule appears twice. Um, the next one down, Envelo Acto Code prefix. The first three digits of the Acto Code must match the, the area code for the local authority, e.g. Oxfordshire is 340, so all the everything must begin with 340. This is important of getting the ACTO codes right. Does anyone, is there anything around this else that I need to understand? Any little complexities? Yeah, when boundaries change um, between authorities and when authorities get combined, um, I don't think we dealt with the last set of boundary changes in Cheshire. I, I think this there's still is... the old ones in that term because I don't think anybody knows how to handle it, actually. That's a really good point, and we may want to just sit down and look at that. Not today, but that's definitely... I'll just put over here. I'll pop that in if you want to. Ah, oh, cheers. Thank you. If you could just pop in how we deal with boundary changes and I'll run back to business rules. Um, great. That's good to know. This will also line up with stop at different admin areas, stops with coordinates physically located in different authority to the admin who owns the stop. This is, and I know the one, it's Blackpool Airport has stops going on one side of the road in one local authority and on the other side of the road in another. Um, as most of you are, seem to be almost national receivers of the data, does this matter a lot to you or is this a much more right down in the fine detail at the, at the producing of the bus stops that this matters? <laughs> To be perfectly honest, I mean, I, I,
Neil, I think you froze there. I think Neil's frozen, so we'll come back to that. And just to understand that one. Uh, STOP does not have a valid ACTO code. So a valid ACTO code is a, an alphanumeric string that starts with three digits that is somewhere between seven and 12 characters long, according to some of the rules. Um, is there anything with the ACTO codes and the ACTO code length that's causing people issues? Or is this kind of one of those ones of because it's been in there so long that it's all relatively easy and OK for everyone? It's just important because ACTO codes are important. Yeah, I think for me, it's just as long as it's got a valid ACTO code, that's the only thing. We don't really care so much, you know, about, you know, as, as long as it's unique, I guess, is one of the things. We don't have a, a mismatch in there anywhere else. That's probably pretty important to us. Um, as long as it's valid and that's that's kind of OK. Brilliant. David. Yeah, the, they're used in such different ways in each authority that it would be difficult to unpick it now because, like was said earlier, some authorities put a letter on the end to say, what the direction is, some don't, some use all numbers, some use parish codes in their numbering. So I think we've got to stick with the first three being the area code. The next, the fourth one originally had to be naught or one, but I think it's only been naught now, but Tim can tell us why the one was there, I think. Uh, so the one was there when, um, your neighbouring authority might not have um, sorted out their NAPTAN and you needed it in there. So um, naught means you own it. One means somebody else owns it, but you've put it in. So right. you might have for South Yorkshire 370 uh, and then a one um, and then the stop number because actually it was put in by South Yorkshire, but it could be in another area. It was also originally used for um, stops w within private land, um, so factories and schools and things like that. But again, that's that's fallen out of use and um, private stops on private land, I think, probably are now all zeros rather than ones. So really, we've got to get away from you being able to define a code in another area, haven't we? Because that, that gives you duplicates across the yeah. boundaries now. Yes. So the one here that says about in other areas, in a different authority, they've really got to be stripped out of the database. Yeah, it should be quite easy or, to identify what who's done it and um, get them to adjust it. Absolutely, and I think it's about, and right now it's about identifying them. Uh, Neil, you you were saying something and you froze, and then we'll, that's why I put the little sticker in. Yeah, very good. It's quite warm up here today as well. Um, uh, yeah, what I was saying was um, when I first started using um, NAPTAN, I, I tried to find the, the information about what locality codes pertain to localities and and, and local authorities, and, and I couldn't find anything. So I I don't use those numbers that sort of um, the terminology at all. I just use point and polygon and GIS. So I, I use the latest local authority file from from boundary line and just you know what point is in what local authority. So if there's a local authority that owns a bus stop in a different local authority area, that doesn't really matter to you. I'm just interested in, in where it is, what local authority is it in. Um, and I use GIS for that out with of that time. So GIS is the the uh, geographical something something? A geographic information system. So basically I I am um, using NAPTAN as an input into uh, a recipe 
along with Ordnance Survey data to, to cook up some new derived information. Um, right. So it's NEPTAN. So using NEPTAN plus uh, ONS, ONS slash GIS to uh, cook up. Cool. That makes some sense. Um, because one of the, one of the things we want to look at is around the localities and the nub tig relationships to all of this. Um, now we hit the, st the the stop and road, so let's pull them all down into a little corner because there's two duplicates which I'll just put on top of each other. Um, but there's also the two hundred and the one hundred. Um, so these two to me appear to be the same except one's harsher than the other um and it's the stop has a street name that's not found within its coordinate in the in the area of its coordinates so if i've got a street that runs to just stays the same street but changes name several times um that's sometimes triggering this as far as we're aware because of the boundaries of the name change can be different um, and can also be different by custom uh, and also when you're at junctions how do you label something at a junction when the junction might be a little bit further away how are you seeing these couple of rules because i'm just wanting to understand as consumers what these rules mean to you Do these rules matter? I know that we've got them as important rules, but do they uh, are they really important right now, Dan? Uh, yes, I guess um, we don't really care about the street name, being completely honest in the data um, at all, uh, because yeah, we, we, we found issues with it, and if we're using a, a, an authoritative road network at the bottom, so audit survey data or something like that. And as long as the position is correct, we can you know, derive that information downstream. Also, we find sometimes that, and it's actually something that's been much improved with OS data with the highways data set. You've got local names for roads and you've got the actual road name, or you've got like an A road number classification as well. So actually a road name could be two or three different elements. Uh, it could be a locally known name, it could be the legal name, it could be the the, the, you know, the the 8281 or something like that as well. Right, cool. I've got you there. And one of the other ones is um, when you're saying that, do, are you are you using this data to display it anywhere or is this like on real time displays and things like that or are you using this data within planning pieces i'm just trying to understand because the the road the name can be a name that can link to a, that can talk about a road that might be the local name so it's the it's what people taking the bus might know that that piece of road as and just trying to, to to unpick some of that kind of little bit of crazy there. Does that make sense? Have I added confusion? I'm just trying to understand, Dan, how you're using the data. Yes, yeah, so I guess we use it um, sometimes when we're displaying on a map effectively. And if you've got a base map behind that, like a, a, an ordnance survey map or something, you've got the, the street name on there. So we don't really add any extra information with regards to that. Um, you know, most people know a name by the stop name itself, and the stop name uh, is much more complex. And I'd rather that be more accurate than the street name, because the stop name is quite often is, is out of date, you know, outside the police station or the police station disappeared five <laughs> years ago. And the street name. So, so this is um, the that those common names and short common name fields and locality fields are far more important than the street name for, for the stop road. For, for our organisation, yes. Because, yeah, we can infill data um, as when we need it, but it could be different to other people. Does anyone else have that, have that difference? Neil, you've got your hand up. That might be a legacy hand. 
I'm aware. Um, is there anyone who uses street name as like an important signifier or are you all putting it onto maps and doing it in, a, in that slightly different way? Cool, that's really good to help us understand. Um, just flying past the other ones, just aware of time. Uh, stop road distance, stop point is more than 200 metres from the road. I'll throw that one down here because that is around the 100 metres from a road and we've just, it's a slightly more strict version of another rule, which I, I still don't understand how these rules came into existence. The stop code and authority of different areas, that's that one again. That's those ones there. Uh, stops with the wrong bearings. There's another admin area. Let me just throw that one there. Um, stops with the wrong bearing. Stop has a bearing that is different to the calculated bearing of the road link it is connected to. And then it goes on to a whole pile of stuff around bearings. Does this matter to you as consumers? I know that it matters to people who are plot, who are trying to get buses to do bus routing. Um, David. Yeah, for that very reason that you need to know which direction the bus is going so that you can put the times at the right stop for the downstream users. Mm -hmm. And also it does trigger systems on the bus. Cool. Just, sec. Just had a pigeon attacking my window. Um, there's a whole pile of stuff um, around whether we put in numbers or whether we put in compass points. What, given, given the accuracy of what we can get roads and things like that, we then seem to just break off into the 16 compass points. Is the 16 compass points enough or do we need the actual degrees on that road down to less than 25? Uh, what is it, 22.5, which is halfway between a north and a northwest, for example. So just trying to understand the degree of accuracy. Currently, it's kind of 45 degrees because we know it's going north or northwest or west. Um, so are, are we needing to get much closer than that? And David? So the, the closer we can get, the better. But originally, it was the compass points because it was a text field and you couldn't put numbers in it mm -hmm. and it was thought at the time that, that that was all the accuracy we needed because we were just doing general directions and we weren't we weren't using the stops to form part of the routes and for any other reasons. So historically we got away with compass points but if we could get bearings that would be well well meant. mixing up all of my slang there because New Zealand accents, New Zealand slang and, and British slang is slowly melding after 15 years here. Um, just very quickly, um, we've got stop proximity. It's too close to another stop. There's a couple here. There's two that, that, that were the same. Does this one really matter to you or is it about um, is it about routing or is what what sort of complications does this one bring up for you as consumers? David, you've got your hand up and I'm, I'm wondering if that's a legacy hand or you've got a thought on this one. I'm thinking that it's it was an original trap to make sure that when you defined stops that were close together, you did have separate locations for them along a road or in a bus station to make sure that you'd got the correct number of bays and that you hadn't duplicated something. Mm -hmm. Right. Is So th this might be a, a historical leftover thing that's really no longer needed or do we still think that this one is still a super valid kind of piece that we need to include. I wouldn't have thought it was Im as important as the others at the moment because more people are going to have software to to stop that happening before they put it in. 
Mm -hmm. Great. This is great because if we can get away with implementing half of the 131, that's half the effort that we've got to put in, which is going to allow us to deliver slightly more value in other places and, and focus. Um, I'm going to leave that there for now, but I will leave this up for the rest of the day if people want to put some thoughts on the last three that we didn't quite touch. Um, the one is about bearing. Um, which we kind of already know the importance of bearing. And the other one is about the street, and we've already discussed the importance of the street. Um, and we've also already discussed the the importance of, of admin areas and things like that. Um, so I want to move on to number five, which is around some new complications that have come up. And I want to discuss, I want to get your thoughts on this. So this is just getting your high level thoughts and you're not beholden to anything that you say here. And don't worry, we're not going to make any ginormous changes without bringing out and doing much, much more of this. So we've got a nice little grid pattern with like up the top, i.e. this is good. Don't like at the bottom, i.e. I really don't, I don't think this would be a good thing. And then we've got significant impact and little or no impact. So if we did this, would it impact you or would it have little impact on you? Um, and then there's some green ones, which are the ones that currently exist. So I have focused on stops.csv and not the whole CSV file because it's focusing on the core. So we've got stops.csv in version 2.1. This will come out in a moment for national, for selected local authority, and then XML for selected local authority and for the and for national. Then we've got some things that are possible in the new system. Deep breath. We've got stops.csv with redundant fields removed. So we know that there are some fields that are no longer used, that there's no longer any data for, that are redundant because the technology isn't there anymore. Um, the clearance codes for bus stops, that technology no longer exists. So why have a field and why, why put it out there? Um, for national and for local authority, what we could also do is do um, let's go down and then I'll come back up to the mixed, what I mean by mixed. We've got stops.csv in version 2.4, so in a slightly different format for national and in a slightly different format for a selected local authority, and also merging to, moving to version 2.5, whether you like it, whether it would have big impact um, for national and for local authority. And then we've got the XML versions for both of those. Then we've got what we've called XML mixed. So what this would be is you'd be able to get the XML of whatever a local authority could give us. So if a local authority can give us 2.5 data, we'll take that and we'll present it back out to you. But if a local authority can only give 2.1, we'll take that and we'll present that back out for you. So if you went for selecting those two local authorities, you'd have a file that had a mix of those two XML standards. Um, and of course, the national one would have a mix of those standards. One of the things that we're looking at is being able to tell you who's doing what standard as well. So with that kind of confusing, but hopefully clear enough explanation, can you duplicate those stickies and place them on the grid? So what it would mean for you. Um, I just want you to duplicate them because otherwise I've realized it's all just going to go a bit awry. Um, and let us know what's going to, what you'd like and what would have significant impact if we were to do some of the changes. So the green stuff essentially would be neutral impact because that's what you've got already. And anything in yellow is the new stuff that we can provide. Because we want to look at of these options, what's useful to you and what's going to break you and we definitely don't want to break you so um, i'm aware of the time and i'm going to give you a nice five minutes to kind of think about these and move these around and then we'll have a quick chat and then i'll go on to talk about scope of what we're of what we've got planned wrong way cool 
So this is making me, I know it looks messy, but this is actually making me sort of happy because what I'm seeing is there's a pile of stuff, there's quite a varied view, but there's nobody who, who's saying, I don't like this and it would have a significant impact on me. If you don't like it, it's going to have a little impact um, and the stuff that you like that would have significant impact, we would possibly be able to discuss the benefit of those changes. Um, so this is really good. It allows us to go away and have some thoughts. We'll definitely bring this back to you a little bit more and discuss a bit more about how, what this means to us technically, which ones we're going to focus on and how we're going to do that. Does anyone have any quick thoughts about this? Was there anything there that you were like, whoa, this is either the best thing since sliced bread and this is a total wow for me or why on earth would you do something this crazy? Neil. Well, I guess I'm, I'm going to show my ignorance here and, um, and say that I don't know what the difference is between 2.1, 2.4 and 2.5. Um, and I suppose it highlights how I consume the data in, in that I tend to go in on a snapshot basis and, and download CSV files to use, um, to compare against our, our network trans exchange files or to, to map things in GIS. And, and it's not a sort of, live online consumer facing products that I'm doing. I'm, it's almost like um, uh, piecemeal research type stuff. Um, so the 2.1, 2.4 and 2.5 are the different NAPTAN standards. Um, and there's 2.1 is the, uh, I'm almost seeing it as 2.1 is the core and four and five are extensions of that. Um, and I know, 2.5 has accessibility that will should have accessibility data in it. Uh, 2.4 has some more information in it. So we're just trying to understand because some local transport authorities are able to produce the slightly more data rich feeds and some aren't and the current NAPTAN hasn't been able to handle them so it's just basically thrown away any data it didn't understand. We're building something a, little, uh, a lot more extensible so we wanted to make sure that if we were able to take this data in it wasn't going to ruin your lives. Okay so it's just it's just extra attribute fields as opposed to any large-scale change in, in the data model sort of thing. Tim would be able to confirm that but I believe it's just extra fields um yeah the, the core data model is the same between them the the major difference with 2.5 is it includes accessibility as dr j said um 2.4 the, the the real important change is that you can um include stops in um ireland and northern ireland because it allows for their national the national the irish grid rather than the GB grid, and I think it also includes Isle of Man from memory, whereas you couldn't do those buses before. Um, so 2.4 is less to worry about. 2.5 is the one to really aim for, because that's got all the accessibility information in it. And I'm, take, I'm taking a guess, Dan, I'll come to you in a second, just taking a guess that 2.5 is built on top of 2.4, so it's kind of those incremental layerings of layer cake. Yes, I don't think there's any breaking changes um, in any of it. It's I'm, so I'm not as I'm not. You might note I'm not insane enough to have put NetX on there because that would be like a massive change. Dan, just coming to you for any thoughts. Yes, I said that my main uh, thing here would be I think 2.5 is great as long as it's filled in consistently throughout the whole data set. You know, I'd love to have a 2.5 CSV with everything there, but if I, there was gaps in the data where some authorities produced it and other authorities didn't, as we consume national data, we can't have gaps in the data, so we would ignore any of that stuff that comes through. So it'd be great to have it, but more important to ha is to have it and have a complete data set. And 
that's one of the things that I think we're having to look at as to what would be required for some of the local transport authorities to catch up. We know that there's, uh, and Sindhu's still here, we know that there's a local transport authority that's using an ACORN computer currently to produce this data. Yes, I know. I, I just love the, look, love the look on Neil's face. Mike hasn't blinked at all, but Neil just kind of did a double take. I also did a double take because I had to go and explain to my team, some of my team, what an ACORN computer was. They'd seen them in their history classes, history of computing, and didn't realise anyone was still using one. I'm sure yeah. at some point as we go out and prod, there is somebody still with a um, punch card system that is being used for NAPTAN somewhere. A green stagecoach. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm actually new to this role. It's just been about four months. Uh, I was told that we're using Acon, but I think I came at the right time because we're having that transition to a new software, which, which looks amazing at the moment. <laughs> So it's really good. It's really good to kind of have that going on. Um, so what I'd like to do now is I'm going to, we've, we've got about just under half an hour. I'd like to share with you the scope that we're working towards um, and some ideas. Adrian's here as well. Um, and then I've got a little section for you to give your feedback and your thoughts on it. So there's another one, another file link that you should have been sent. Um, here is the bit, here here is the link and here is the password if you weren't sent it, but I'll share it up here. And I'm going to talk through it backwards, which might sound the wrong thing, but I think it's the the best way of understanding it. So I'm just going to flip us across to that other board, and I see you all joined me there, which is fantastic. So you won't be able to change anything here what you will be able to do is put stickies on there so if there's stuff that you go I once I've explained it I still don't understand this or I think this is completely wrong or this is a million miles from where it needs to be please give us that feedback because that's really going to help us um, just really quickly on language if this is us here Horizon one is the stuff that we know and we've got planned out and we know pretty much where we're going to head to. Horizon two is a bit more fuzzy and Horizon three is that far mountain that we're aiming towards. And one of the importances of getting Horizon three rightish is that if you if you think you're heading over there and you should be heading over there, it's actually really important to get that kind of right now. Otherwise, you're going to end up having some big course corrections along the way. So if we move across to the right hand side, you'll see Horizon 3. And this is what we're thinking about in terms of where we would like to get to. And I'll just quickly talk through it. Um, so we've got on the left, we've got the public transport planning. And on the right, we've got our goal and our grand goal of everything that we're doing here is increased public transport usage. That's the thing that everything's driving towards. So we have some planning. We have our data producer who can upload their data into these systems and they can use either an API or a web UI or a web interface. Um, they can upload NubTig, NAPTAN, BODS, whatever. All of the different systems are able to talk to each other via APIs, and there's a single identity management system. So that means that if you've if you you've got a single login that works everywhere effectively, and it knows who you are and it knows what access you should have. So if you should be able to write to BODs, it tells you that. If you should just be able to read BODs, it sorts that out. Then we've got the data consumers off on the right here who can download whatever of these all of this information via an API or a web UI, so they can take that information down. And we think you do two things with it. And this is this would be a really good point to get your feedback that I've got this right. We think there are two things that, that are produced from this data. One is ecosystem apps. So these are for bus operator apps. These are route planning apps. These are local authority management apps. And then we think there are consumer apps. So these are things like Google, Apple, Apple, City Mapper, travel planning apps for different areas. Um, 
And one of the things that we're trying to do is keep all of this open data and call it the DFT open data sets. So being aware that it's 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 owned by DFT, its infrastructure is owned by DFT. And there's a team who sets the policy, who does the operations and support. So they have a common system and a common understanding across all of the different systems. So that's what we're aiming for for 2525. No, 2025. I was singing the song in my head. Um, is there anything there that raises a red flag or you think you've completely missed? Now, I do now know that we've missed the national, the, the coach bods. So um, I'm uh, T, uh, NCSD, so I will put that on the next version of this and I will update this to include that. Is there anything else that would appear to be missing or that we've got completely off piste here? Does this seem a reasonable thing? Are we being ambitious enough? And I know this is one of my first times of working with government, so um, there could be 2030. It's it's a future date. I'm aware that time time frames slip and funding funding will change some of this. I would say if anything, the date's not uh, it's too far away. The date's too far away. Well, you've got to grow public transport usage and things like there's lots of things going on now about you know smart cities lots of things going on about the conversion to electric buses and things like that and you need to have good data that underpins all of that um and i think you know people are starting to build apps and things already and 2025 is you know four years away is a minimum is naptan the sort of core of that do you think you think it's got a strong role to play in, in developing that 100% because you need to know where the stop is. If you don't know where the stop is or the stop is in the wrong location, if you try to do any automation for, as uh, I think David said from Ticketer earlier on, you need to know where the location is to drive automation of, you know, purchasing things and things like that. So yeah, Naptan is the glue, I think, of anything that comes before that. So if you're able to use BODs, you've got the timetables, but if you don't know where the bus is stopping accurately, um, then actually that's pretty useless in itself. I think it's been said before, but we'll take that glue and maybe trademark that as one of the Naptan sayings. <laughs> yeah, I've used, I've started, I started off with gold standard, but I do like glue um, as the as the piece there. Um, the other thing I'm, it, I'm slightly confused about on this is what what is the DFT's role in this compared to the private sector role? So there's people out there in the private sector offering lots of these services at the moment. Um, luckily, we're not one of them, um, but there are lots of private sector clients offering, you know, API access to stops and things like that. Is the DFT considering at all about stepping on private organisations' toes by producing this stuff? And do they see their role as a data you know, supplier or a data provider or, or you know, or a, you know, a services supplier? That's a really interesting point. I'm going to pass that one to Adrian. Um, I, I don't think so. I think we see our role just in, in so much as that nobody else can really play that role of collecting all the local authority data. You know, there's a legal requirement for local authorities to send us the data for us to collect that and then just to make that in accessible with a format for people to collect. Um, so our role is that bit at the bottom, really, which is just around the operation of, of how that works and how we collect in the data and how we make that available. And then to make sure that that service is run properly and is supported and maintained. OK. Mike. Hi there. Um, I just I don't know if this is the right point to ask it, but um, what what's the position on, in terms of the um, the, the replacement for the ETO well viewing tool um, because that's something that the DF that you are developing isn't it as as the DFT is developing that rather than the private sector um, let's we will actually touch on that as we come back okay. through uh, and talk about some of the work that's coming up okay um, but thank you for raising it. That's a really good point. One of the things that I raised here is fewer false positives and validation against a clear set of business rules. So while that's on this far horizon, that might be stuff that, that we can start doing incrementally 
as we move through. This is the stuff that we would like to have done by this time. Yeah. And it won't, uh, the way that I'm thinking about it is not as a big bang type presentation, but as a slow incremental progression towards something like this. So there might be bits of this that get built well before others, simply because those were the most valuable bits to get done first. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'm going to swing back across to the side here and talk about Horizon 1, which is the bit that we're working on currently. This is the bit that we know, and we've broken it into three releases because I like the things of threes. Um, and what we've tried to do is explain all of these in terms of what someone would get as a user. So I'll start off with release one and then I'll lightly run through release two, highlighting a couple of points that I think this audience might find interesting and then release three. And then we can look at what's in that gap in between on the horizon. So in release one, which is what we're currently working on, we've got this person, which is represents any one of you. As a consumer of NAPTAN data, I want to download NAPTAN data anonymously so that I can maintain my database for transport access points. So this is saying I anonymous download from a system. I want to be able to download the data and put it into maintaining the database that I've already got. Hopefully that's not a contentious viewpoint of the world. Then we've got the next person down, which is effectively an Adrian or an Ursuline. Um, as, D as a DFT manager responsible for publishing NAPTAN data, I want to have a publicly available site to the DFT standard so that I can be assured we can responsibly publish data. So we want to make sure that when we put the data up, it's stable, it's solid, it, it we it's not falling down, we, we're not struggling to process files, we can produce files to the right standards, um, and you know if you're going to get this file, you can tell when it was updated and things like this. And then we've got this third person here. As a DFT employee responsible for supporting NAPTAN users, I want to proactively manage issues with stability and data access so that I can give the best service to our users. So this is ensuring that we who are going to be maintaining it and running it can see when the system's struggling. We can proactively figure out when things are going wrong. We can see if it's struggling to download files or present files to you or produce those files from the inputs. Is there any can anything contentious with those kind of three core users that we're working on at the moment? Have I missed something in, in these descriptions of users? Fantastic. Um, the next things that we're going to be working on, so this is like a little MVP, a very thin slice, ensuring that we get one thing done, we get it right, and we can start iterating on how to make that better, how to make that smoother, how it looks, how it feels, how it's used. We then move on to release two, and I'm just going to fly through a couple. So for as a consumer of NAPTAN data, I want to save my downloaded preferences for NAPTAN. So this is the area, the file types, those kind of things, so that I can more, more easily get the data I need for my system. So this is the start of giving you like a login or some identity management service. Um, and we've got here as a DFT manager responsible for publishing the data, I want to manage and store users' identity and preferences to GDPR standards so that I can be assured we are correctly handling, handling user data. So we want to make sure that when we start setting up any preferences, any accounts, that we're handling all of that data responsibly. And then this is where somebody like Sindhu would become involved as a local transport authority producing NAPTAN data, I want to upload NAPTAN data for a single ACTO code so that I can publish my data to other local transport authorities, bus operators and software developers. That makes sense, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Fantastic. And, and I thought, was just trying to say why you wanted to do it would be really, really clear. Um, and then I've got a number of complicated 
you'll see this local transport authority gets more and more complicated in what they're doing as it goes down as, as it goes down so it's somebody who's got an acto code and tram stops as somebody who's got multiple acto codes and somebody who's got multiple acto code and tram stops so trying to reflect some of those real complications that are coming in from people like Sindhu who are needing to put in data because if somebody is managing their tram stops like Croydon's tram stops are managed by the Croydon people and yet they still have to come in by TFL, they still have to come and tell DFT to get them to update the location of a stop when it gets moved or something like that. So we're just trying to look at can we make that a little bit smoother. Um, but the very last one I wanted to, which brings on to Mike point, Mike's point, as a DFT manager responsible for publishing NAPTAN data, I want to have a plan for my for deprecating the old data quality checking systems for NAPTAN so that I am only managing and supporting the new system. So what we're trying to say is by the time that we've got people uploading data, we want to start building out a plan for how we can replace that system, how we, we will know exactly how people are, are putting data in, we will have built the core of that system and we know the feedback loop that that feeds for data quality and we want to make sure that we can build that in. Now, if as consumers you need to also view that quality data, we want to look at how we provide you access to that quality information. We want to look at how we provide you, do you need it granular, do you need it as an aggregate for an area, what's the best way to tell you what the quality of this data is and how can you consume that in a way that makes sense but also how can we give that information to people like Sindhu in a really quick responsive way so that when they upload data they can see hey by the way you've made a boo-boo on this and your Eastings and your Northings don't match with your latitude longitude and your stop is in three different places or two different places so um, just kind of raising some of those little issues up um, does that make sense, Mike? Does that answer your question that that, that you had previously? Um, yeah, I, 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 I think so. Um, I, I was just really concerned, thinking about the making sure there was no gap in 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 availability of at least a system for viewing the data, because obviously there is there is a lot of periods of time where I think um, the other guy said. You're just looking at things in a piecemeal fashion, which is which is fine. You just download a data set, and you might use it for real-time information or something. Um, and I tend to to agree that you know a lot of the time, whether it's 2.1 or 2.5, unless it, 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 it makes very little difference at the end user end, unless you're looking at accessibility stuff. But having some kind of a tool to to just view the information is important. And I'm obviously I was just thinking along the lines of the ETO tool is, I think, has only been extended till the middle of this year. So, will the new tool be available in time to 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 fit in without there being a gap? That's what I was thinking. Adrian, I'll throw that one to you. So, we def we've extended the ETO tool for a minimum of six months. All oh, right, okay. Subject to the, you know, how long it takes us to put something. So, we'll make sure there's something in place all of the time it just we don't know exactly when the cutoff is going to be on the old to the new at the moment because anything with software development i'm willing to give an exact time frame on um, because who knows what wormholes uh, <laughs> exist between now and then um but yeah so it's a minimum of six months and we will make sure there's some provision um there all the time okay uh, that's that's good thank you no problem. but mike it was also really good to get your viewpoint of that you need a tool to just view the information. That's a really good point to have made because I think that helps us think about the different uses of what the ETO World tool was being used for because sometimes we think it's being used for one thing and in fact it's being used as something else and this is allowing us to kind of get those different viewpoints on it. So I really appreciate that feedback. Well, it, it was useful. It, just the other day, I, I was in a meeting with some suppliers and we had to just talk about um, SMS codes, which are very rarely used anymore, which I think are actually 
they're actually called NAPTAN code, I think, in, in the in the specification. And the actual what we call NAPTAN code is called APCO code. It just just to but um, it, it was just useful just to be able to go on the ETO world tool and and while on the call and say this is what we're talking about. Not, not many people use them, but they're, they're still there and they still you can still use that service and it's still it's still prevalent in the travelline.info website and we'll refer to it and it and is a way of referencing the stop if you want it to be that daft rather than re referencing it with the the, the um, ATCO code. So yeah, having having some kind of um, visual tool, I think is important rather than just having to download a spreadsheet full of things um, in order to, to, this is why one of the things I said before is that the accessibility of this information as well as accuracy is important. So that's why I think we need this editor thing, this what uh, editor viewer viewing tool, I should say. Yep. So, yeah, Adrian's um, uh, put my mind at ease by saying that it, it isn't a fixed six months. So thanks for that. Cheers. Excellent. <laughs> Neil. But, well, it's just interesting when you're talking about nobody using SMS codes um, because actually um, I, I think it may well increase in popularity and, and certainly up in Perth um, they're, they're, being used, they're not being used as SMS codes, they're translated into um, QR codes and they're used that way. Ah, that's really good to understand. So the translation into QR codes. So the QR codes that people have at the bus stops, it's actually using the SMS yeah. information. That I really, Adrian, could you put a little action point on the other on the other mural for us to follow that up? Because I think that's a really good point. I'm I'm aware of the time, so I just want to run through release three super fast, and then we'll flick back to the other. Um, to the other mural, what I'd like you to do is if there's anything that you'd like to give us feedback on, because I know that we're running out of time, just put stickies on here and just say, this is great, this isn't great, I'm worried about this, this causes me concern, this would be brilliant, but have you considered this? So um, in the last one, we've got NubTig, the MPTG data, um, and then we've also got being able to turn off getting a plan to turn off the old system. So we can't. We know we can't turn off the old server until we've gotten rid of all the NubTech data as well. We've found a way of um, people being able to produce and consume it. Um, and within Horizon 2, we've got a couple of pieces in here already, and I'd like you to think about what else you think would be really great to have in Horizon 2. So this is switching off the old site, defining accessibility standards, getting a funding for a schema change, and visualization maps of the stops. Now, I know the visualization is sitting there. That is something that we may need to bring forward based on feedback we may need to look at. And this is one of those pieces where this isn't set in stone, because we might find that some of these things we don't need to do. So is there any red flags in any of this? Anything that, that's causing anyone concern? Mike. Um, no, no, I don't, I, I don't think so. I mean, the only thing I would say is just to reiterate what, what was already been said in terms of the uh, It'd be interesting to know what the timescales are on each of these um, releases and horizons, if you like, in terms of when things are likely to happen. Or you're planning for them to happen, I should say. I think uh, that's something Adrian and I can work on and hopefully at some point we'll be able to put some some sort of data ideas around them. That's why there's there's basically then next and then next next because it's trying to show where they would be. We've got some ideas of the time, but I don't want to say it because that sets expectations and we are still uncovering pieces. You go to do something and you suddenly find there's a whole rabbit hole that's sitting that's been hidden by the rock that you thought. Once I get the rock out the way, it'll be a clear going and there's another 
thing at, at the moment. Um, so let's just, oh, Dan, before we move on. Yeah, I've just got a slight question. So I remember ages ago, I got interviewed about Naptan and there was all like new fields that put into Naptan and there's, you know, not just looking at existing data, but other new data could be put into Naptan. Um, what's the thought around us? This, all this seems to be based around the current data and the current uh, formats of it. But there's a big thing about what other stuff could be put into Naptan to make Naptan an even better data set. I'm not seeing anything around that here. Is that still on the agenda at all? Obviously that will require different schemas with new fields and things like that. What's the, what's the kind of thought around that? For me, uh, I was just gonna quickly give mine. That would be great to put into, if you put those thoughts into Horizon, that Horizon 2 section for us. But I think the what we might have been talking about as well is we currently can, own, the current NAPTAN can only eat 2.1. If you give it anything else, it just throws it away. So that has been one of the things that I know that we've been talking about. Adrian. Yeah, I think when we were very, uh naive and enthusiastic when we first started looking at Naptan and I think we you know the team of people that hadn't ever worked on Naptan was assembled um, last year it seemed like there was lots of things like well there's new new transport things that we might want to put in there I think having worked on this for a little bit now we're just uh, you know conscious of the complexity and the history that has happened of the you know, of the years that it's been and um slightly less ambitious to go so quickly in adding new things in and making schema changes. Um, partially just because we realised the impact that would have on the people that um, provide the data and how we need to make sure that we can do that in a supportive and, and sort of collaborative way, which will take longer. And so we wanted to focus now on, can we replace something that and means we can switch off the old sites so we're not dual running for a long time and we can have a more stable, robust, um, and better functioning um, sort of basic site, and then we can start to add on more complex things and, and, and really move this along once that's in place. We get a lot of support calls at the moment that are difficult for us to deal with because of the legacy of the system. Okay, thanks. Brilliant. So very quickly, if we go back to the previous, um, previous mural, previous whiteboard, um, I just, I've put a section up. You've all seen the three columns that I put up. What gives us joy, what frustrated us, and what made us sad. Thinking about the scope that we've just shown, it'd be really great to get your feedback. So I'm aware that we're pretty much out of time. We've got almost no time. We've got no time left. Um, so what I was going to suggest is, is I normally close these sort of at the end of the day. I'll close this at the end of the day tomorrow. So not to hold up your Thursday evenings and I know that you've all got other jobs to go to, but just take some time and look at the scope and give us feedback on it. What gives you joy? What makes you feel great about the scope that we showed? What frustrates you about it? And what makes you sad about it? And it'd be really good. Just put those stickies up and then I will send this out with the recording which will be published um, by Tim, but I also just wanted to close up and thank everyone for your time and your energy and your thoughts today. It's been really brilliant. We, you've given us so much information to really think about and to really help us kind of move this forward. Does anyone have any final thoughts, Dan? No, not really. I thought it was quite useful. Well, thank thanks. you. <laughs> Thank you everyone to, for your con uh, continuing attendance. It is really appreciated from both of us. Um, it's been really helpful. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and also, if anyone wants to get involved in the testing of release one, we're going to we're we're actually starting to iterate on what it's going to look like, and we're starting to iterate on what functionality it's going to have. So get in contact with me or Adrian if you'd really like to be involved with that, and we'll put you in touch with our with our um, user researchers and they can book in some time to sit down and go through some of the ways that it's going to look and feel, but also the functions that it's going to have. That's great. Thank you.